We left mountains, geysers, ice and fire, waterfalls and fjords. We left our friends, our farm, our salmon stream. We left the ocean far behind with all we could afford. We left our homeland, Iceland, for our dream. There's a, a lot of myths about why the Icelanders first came here and about the circumstances under which they arrived. It's uh, sometimes said that they came because the oh, they were smarting under the yoke of Danish rule or the country was overpopulated, that there were all kinds of problems. But most of these are myths created largely by the Icelanders themselves, Canadian Icelanders, who are trying to look back at the background and in a way to sympathize with other ethnic groups. But I think the circumstances under which they came should be made more clear. A number had come in earlier times, a few as early as, as 1850 had made an appearance, but it wasn't until 1874 the first few came over to look the place over. Then in 1875, on March 29th, uh, a volcano in Iceland exploded violently and left a large section of the population homeless. And the second wave of migration that came and the group that ultimately settled in Gimli became largely as a result of being made homeless and not for any other kind of reason. In 1975, there was uh, one of the biggest volcanic eruptions that uh, happened in our historical time, occurred in the central desert of the interior of Iceland, a volcano called Astja, and uh, the ashes uh, covered uh, about one-tenth of the country. It was carried to the east and uh, affected mainly the, some of the valleys in East Iceland and um, in uh, the inner part of these valleys, the ash layer was from uh, 15 to 30 centimeter thick, which meant that every farm in that area had to be abandoned. And people uh, fled from there to the nearby fjords and districts, and uh, some went directly uh, to America because the immigration had already started at that time, but uh, it was more so that they went to uh, relatives and other people in the neighbor area. There, the, it became too crowded there, and it just uh, speeded up the immigration that had already started. And the population of Iceland uh, around 1870 was between uh, 70 and 80,000. Icelandic historians who have been doing research on the emigration from Iceland uh, tell me that uh, during the period from uh, 1874 to 1900, one-fourth, if not one-third, of the Icelandic population as it was around 1870 emigrated to North America. Later generations have tended to look back on Iceland as being a romantic place of beautiful scenery, waterfalls, wonderful meadows where sheep can graze. But the fact is that Iceland of 1875 was a terrible place to live. When I was in Iceland and inquiring about what conditions were like a hundred years ago, I was surprised and shocked to find that uh, my grandfathers and, and uh, his people had lived in turf houses. The old man that I was talking to on the farm said that this certainly would be the turf house that my grandfather had lived in, and he was sure that the animals would have lived in the back of the house. And the old man explained that this was a great advantage because then the warmth from the animals could be used to, to warm the houses. When the immigrants left Iceland, they were often treated as deserters, as people who were leaving a sinking ship. In fact, 
My grandfather told stories of when he was trying to sell his sheep that he was cheated a lot and some people promised to send him money for the sheep after he arrived in Canada. He never received this money. And in fact, he left Iceland with a lot of bitter feelings. They came first to Kinmount, Ontario, and there they settled. And uh, all the good lands were taken up and they were housed in three very, very small cabins just outside of Kenmount. And the change of water and the food and the long journey made so many of them sick that they couldn't work on the railway where they were supposed to be working. And all the children under the age of two died. John Taylor, an Englishman, sort of threw in his lot with them and he decided that something would have to be done to help these people. And he um, went with a couple of men to Ottawa and they got a loan to come send three men here to explore in Manitoba and find out what um, area they could get for a reserve. They were discouraged from, from staying in southern Manitoba because the pre pre previous three years there had been a serious infestation of grasshoppers which had destroyed the crops. They were advised to go north and explore the west shores of the Lake Winnipeg. They found this area very enticing for several reasons. One, there was a lot, lot of woodland, pasture land. The Lake Winnipeg was teeming with fish. And they, they had hopes of uh, being located close to a, a big market. When uh, the people of Winnipeg heard that, the, um, that there were settlers coming from Iceland, and uh, would be uh, uh, here passing through Winnipeg and many of the early Winnipeggers flocked down to the docks to see the, the strange people that were coming. Uh, they uh, envisioned that they would be uh, much like Eskimos or a lot different from, from themselves when, but when they did see them they were quite surprised to see that these were just ordinary people. The first lot is said to have been about 385 people and then about 35 single women and some of them were only children really, children of 15, 12 and 15, stayed behind in, in Winnipeg and uh, got a job as a domestic. They were the only ones who could get a job. And so they were about, oh, a little over 250 thereabouts who came here. The trip from Winnipeg, they left on the 16th of October uh, to float down the river in the scows that they had. And uh, when they were actually in the mouth of the river, they were attached to the Hudson's Bay steamer Colwell and uh, proceeded into the lake. And they were tied in sort of a train of boats and uh, they were pulled north and the intention was to go to the Icelandic River or the Whitemouth River. It was known in the history book at that time. And uh, the wind had changed, and this is what had raised the water. The wind had come from the north, and uh, they uh, got opposite the Willow Point and in Lake Winnipeg, and at that time there was some discussion whether they should go further, but however they were cut loose and the York boat was the one that maneuvered the boats up the channel. My grandmother gave birth to uh, my uncle that same night, and uh, I often remember hearing her tell me that uh, the snow had been swirling in the tent. His mother was in a little ragged tent that the Hudson's Bay Company had generously lent them, all tattered, and um, the snow drifted in through the cracks on the little baby, and she had made an improvised uh, cradle for him out of a, just an old coat that she had sort of strung from end to end, and he was the very first baby born here in this area, and that was down at the South Point, Willow Point. A hundred years have now passed since the landing at Willow Point, and the story of that landing has taken on the shape of a legend. The specific facts of exactly when and exactly where are hotly disputed. Each settler 
told his children and they passed on to their children and through succeeding generations of exactly what happened and everybody now feels he has the truth. Uh, the official version tends to sanctify the settlers to see them as a, something of a band of angels who had uh, arrived here. But there were, they were a human group and there were obviously disputes and clashes. One of the settlers, for instance, records that when they first landed, the boats were to be broken up and used for helping to make shelters. Uh, he complains bitterly that uh, the leaders and their favorites got all the wood and he had to live in a ragged tent. I've been responsible and other have been responsible in writing on, on the subject of the early history of stating that uh, the certain promises uh, made were not kept. Uh, <clears throat> I think this is a largely rumor and not fact. Certainly as far as the Dominion government was concerned. Uh, there was a promise made to cut hay uh, by, uh, by the Icelanders, the two Icelanders that were left in uh, Manitoba uh, when the other three went east to uh, arrange for the transportation of the settlement to the west. The plans were that the settlement was to be made at, at the Icelandic River, which is the present site of Riverton, if they had cut hay. It would have served no particular purpose. There were no cows to feed the first year, and they were in the wrong place anyway because the, the Icelanders landed at Willow Point, 15 miles south of uh, Riverton. The second summer was uh, the uh, summer the uh, big group arrived. There were 1,200 people, approximately. And they came in three groups, if I remember correctly. And they came here expecting to find things in their new colony well organized and ready to take them in as new settlers. And they found uh, a group of very dispirited people who had had a severely hard winter. By 1876, the colony had been gorged with settlers and that led inevitably to overcrowding and inadequate housing. And the smallpox broke out in a cabin that housed 19 people out in Riverton that was then called Linde. And uh, no one had any idea what this was, what the disease was, so that it spread all over the colony before they really realized what it was. And it ravaged the community, it killed 102 people. It was made worse by the fact that the Manitoba government slapped a quarantine on them. They set up this quarantine post in Netley Creek uh, which is uh, 24 miles from Gimli or something like that. But there was uh, unquestionably uh, some violations because this is in the records that they w did everything to try to survive because one must remember they'd had the scurvy before and they were, they were, uh, had malnutrition, uh, they were weak, they were sick, they were overcrowded, they were in little cabins. I remember my sitting and having coffee with my great-grandmother and uh, she, you know, she'd come in 1876, she'd been through the entire thing of the settlement, and uh, she was sitting one day and she said that she remembered as a child during the smallpox epidemic, everyone being too sick to do anything with the people that died, and then simply taking them and outside the doors and leaving them outside the doors in the snow to freeze until later in the, whenever everyone got well. Winnipeg did send out several doctors, uh, they were appalled by the conditions and they mistook the stoic, calm and quiet suffering of the settlers for callous indifference to the fate of their loved ones. So for uh, 10 months, the um, quarantine was, uh, was in force. Uh, this was too bad because it was long past the time it should have been lifted. In March, it was the last um, case of smallpox reported and in July, the um, quarantine was still on. This was not Manitoba. It was still part of the Northwest Territories. And if anyone wanted to go through, they would have to stay for two weeks at the boundary and uh, have a complete change of clothing, a bath, and they were given clothing. And then there was a real a joke among the ice centers that anybody who needed a new suit went to the boundary, waited for two weeks to go to Manitoba and get a brand new suit. At least they got something out of it. Then the quarantine was lifted only uh, the day that the Icelanders 
had decided to take the matters in their own hands and go to the quarantine post and see exactly what was up. There were no efforts made by them to carry guns or bows or arrows. All the able-bodied men walked uh, up to this area and uh, by some strange coincidence, when they arrived there, they were told that the quarantine had been lifted and help would be coming and free intercourse would be possible between the province of Manitoba and the Icelandic Reservation. Icelanders were rebels in politics. They had originally left Norway in the year 874 because they disagreed with the then government in Norway and settled the island now called Iceland. In the saga times, the chieftains of Iceland were looking for a place where the whole country could meet. It happened that a farmer at Thingvatler was found guilty of slaughtering slaves, and so they chose his farm as the national meeting place. After the farm was confiscated from the farmer, Althing was set up in the year 930, and it became the oldest living parliament in the world. The Icelanders have always had a strong tradition of democracy, and they've always had a respect by the, for the law. In the old days, the story of Lögberg, that is the rock of the law, and long ago at Thingvellir, the, um, the man would stand and read the law to the assembled people who listened to him once a year. So everyone knew what the law was. And they had a very strong feeling for the law of the land and the way it was made. Besides the general governing of the land, there was also a time of justice. There are stories about the drowning pool where they Women who committed adultery were drowned. Men who committed the same offense were hanged. There's even an island set aside especially for the purposes of dueling. The Icelanders throughout their history have had this passion for laws and orderly conduct of government business. And this is what they took to New Iceland. New Iceland was, uh, was located north of Manitoba. Therefore, it did not come under the municipal rules and regulations of the government of Manitoba. Uh, there, there, uh, while they, there was some arrangements uh, between the Dominion government and the lieutenant governor of Manitoba that he was, had some responsibility, the, uh, uh, there, there were no easy means of communication or or transportation between the west shores of Lake Winnipeg and, and Winnipeg at the time. Um, and uh, so the settlers immediately decided they had to form some of their own laws, some of their own rules and regulations. They set about making a constitution. They'd been given firm assurances that they would govern themselves. The constitution provided for almost all of the details of ordinary life, but it had some remarkable features. It provided a voting age of only 18 for men of good character. It had no provisions for criminals because the Icelanders did not expect any law breaking. It provided for the settlement of disputes and quite remarkably, it provided for welfare for widows and children. They wanted to be sure that their children would be educated and they wanted to be sure that there was a, a kind of communication which uh, this constitution would provide for. First of all, I could, might say that the settlers did not really need a school to teach anything except English uh, to begin with because uh, teaching was prevalent in the home and they were given all the rudiments of education in the home and through their reading, but they very much wanted to learn English. And uh, nine days after arrival, before they even had a shelter over their heads on October 30th, 1875, John Taylor sent a letter on their behalf about this issue of wanting a school. Now, 
The Ottawa government turned it down because they said they were not responsible for any children as to schooling except Indian children. Whereupon the, uh, the Icelandic settlers built their own school and they secured their own teacher who was a niece of John Taylor, Caroline Taylor. And they had it in operation before Christmas of 1875. The uh, document that they drew up establishing a constitution for the uh, uh, so-called Republic of New Iceland was sent to Ottawa but was never ratified. Uh, but uh, because they were so, the colony was so remote from the center of authority, they operated under this provisional constitution until uh, the boundaries of Manitoba moved north to include the Icelandic reserve. The Icelanders that uh, came here initially uh, uh, were of course uh, mainly farmers and fishermen and the farmers they were used to um, uh, raising cattle or raising sheep and their main cropping practices were grass of course so coming into this kind of a of a land it was uh, it was quite strange to them first of all there were a lot of trees that they had to remove in order to get at uh, the, the soil also they were not in any way used to growing crops other than the grass so it took a long time or, or a number of years at least to develop the technology and get uh, and, and to adapt to the best use of this kind of land when the settlers came they took out homesteads but by no means all of them stayed on the homesteads. They used the homestead when they developed it as a stake to give them enough money to get started in the city. The people were, were basically urban rather than, than rural. They, they preferred to live in groups. They didn't like farming very much. And so most of them, or many of them I should say, moved off the land. Uh, the main industry, of course, was fishing. I've often thought that they, uh, those early uh, fishermen uh, did uh, miraculously well in, in uh, adapting to the type of uh, fishing that they had to experience in this country because uh, during the winter time the ice freezes to, to a depth of about three feet and uh, nets had to be put under the ice during the winter which uh, they had never seen or heard of being done before. And uh, they learned just by trials and errors. Most of the fishing earlier was done by dog team and, and they adapted that from the, uh, the Indian native people and uh, from the Hudson Bay fur traders. They, they had uh, all their transportation in the fur trade was done by, by dog team. And uh, I recall um, up to a few years ago, we still had, uh, had dogs at the time we changed over to snowmobiles and bombardiers. Of course, in the summertime, they had to fish on, on sailboats. And most of them went to the north part of the lake, which is a lot bigger than the, than the south end of, of, of Lake Winnipeg. And uh, having to row with these boats sometimes if there was no wind uh, while setting their nets, uh, it just must have been a tremendous hard job. Says old Ole Niha, there's fish in the channel. Just follow me, boy, yeah, you'll get all that you care. But Ole forgets, and he can't find his nets. But still he goes fishing each fall at Black Bear. My father was a fisherman for years on the lake. Unfortunately, he got seasick. Every time he went out to lift his nets, he would row out to his nets, vomit, lift some nets, vomit, lift some more, vomit, and then row home. Mother says that he came in green every day. The lake may grow rough as the nights they grow longer. The fish slime will freeze on the mitts that they wear. No, it isn't for sport that they fish at this port, but they don't give a damn for the cold at Black Bear. There were some 1,500 people in the New Iceland colony at the peak. After the exodus to North Dakota and the migration to the Argyle district, there were some 250 left. The greater number of these would be at Lundy 
on the Eastern River, now Everton, where there was a sawmill and where there was employment. One of the men, the last to leave, tells a poignant story of uh, driving along the road in New Iceland, passing one house after another, standing vacant. People argue as to whether New Iceland split as a result of a religious disp dispute or whether it was simple economics, but uh, some people see it simply as a desire to have something better than they left behind in Iceland. Well, there are number, numerous reasons. One of them was um, uh, internal conflict over religion and, uh, and possibly other, other opinions. Then there was the, the disastrous flood of 1879 where, um, where a lot of people lost their, their father, or their father was, was uh, almost ruined, and they had an awful time to winter their animals. And um, there may be many other reasons, too. I think many of them were discouraged over the slowness of, of progress in the heavy timbered country that they were trying to develop. A substantial number moved to the Tiger Hills, that became known as the Argyle Settlement between Glenborough and Balder. It was really a direct result of a letter that Everett Parsonage sent to uh, Sigurdur Christofferson and uh, some of the other people in Gimli and told them about the beautiful land down here. So they came here and uh, they camped this one night um, near this hill and uh, Mr. Parsonage jumped on his horse and thought he'd take a ride out just to look over, see what was on the other side of the hill. And he came galloping back and he said, I have found paradise. The following spring, these four men, with their family, Scaftiars and these other three chaps, took their families and fox sleighs and, and a few head of cattle and left for cross, cross country to go to their homesteads. When they got there, my grandfather was two and a half miles from his homestead. But there were two bachelors living at Oak Creek in a bit of a cabin there. My grandfather had a three-year-old boy and a baby who was less than a year old and hadn't been too well nourished. So he asked these two chaps if they would consent in getting some milk for the baby. And they said, I'm sorry, but we have to have all the milk for the calf. So the old boy, I shouldn't be saying this, you know, but he got up during the night when everybody else was asleep and stole a little bit of milk each night from the cow in order to keep this baby alive. Now this just gives you an illustration of how desperate some of these people were. Of the 1875 group that came from Ontario, about 50 more or less remained in Winnipeg that fall, uh, mainly young girls who obtained a domestic employment. But there were others who then or later obtained work sawing wood and loading uh, firewood on the river steamers. By 1877, probably, a shanty town had begun to grow on what was called the Hudson Bay Company Flats, where the CNR yards are now located. Where temporary, these people were squatters. But by the early 1880s, a large number had begun to move in on Ross and Elgin, the two avenues that became fairly solidly Icelandic. By 1904, the settlement had extended to Sargent Avenue, uh, from, uh, well, from Maryland as far west as uh, Home Street. And Sargent and Victor was the headquarters, that's where the church was, and right there was also the Lurbeg, and down the street where the entertainers were, and Banning, there was the Hamescreamer, the other newspaper. And in between were all kinds of shops and jewelry shops and, and all kinds of libraries and so on, bookstores. Then there was a famous cafe called the Weevil Cafe, and everybody went there for coffee, both sides joined together for coffee. Then there was, of course, a pool room, the Falcon Athletic Club, which I happened to be a member of at the time. 
And my father was quite a pool shark, and he used to play against all the other people like Oscar de Pietro Johansson, and uh, they used to fight it out, you know. The Icelanders were tremendous sports. They were aggressive in sport. They were good natured, too, but aggressive. If I was uh, playing hockey and I was facing an Icelander, I'd, well, I suppose I'd probably give him the puck. He'd take it away anyway. But um, they formed uh, a hockey team, hockey club, the Falcons, before the first war. But they just got going when the war came. And then they all enlisted in a body in the 223rd Battalion, went overseas. And when they came back from the war, they started in all of them again, for they had practically left off years before, because most of them were two and three years away in the war. We just built up so many fans in such a short period of time that there was intense rivalry between the, the two factions. Uh, uh, Suckuk would uh, declare a holiday down there when they were going to play the Falcons in Winnipeg. They had some good Icelanders on their team, too, from Selkirk. There, that was quite a settlement down there, too, of Icelandic people. Jack Smiley was a heavyweight, 250 pounds. And his most, the most famous incident about him was that when Winnipeg was playing soccer, Jack Snyder declared that he would walk the rail every time Falcon scored a goal. And he did time after time. One time he fell on the ice. <laughs> his friend Jack, Captain Lund, was pretty near as wild about the Falcons as Snyder. And he was one time was cheering madly for the Falcons and leaned over the rail and his false teeth fell on the ice. <laughs> Then they tried to get in the same league and they finally did. And won the championship of Winnipeg in these four, five, six teams. Went to Brandon, beat Brandon, beat Fort William, and went to Toronto. Tremendous excitement because the University of Toronto team was considered to be very powerful. And they beat them. Then that meant that they were going to represent Canada in the Olympics. This was 1920, the first year hockey was included in the Olympics. So, a week or two later, here were the Icelanders, <laughs> Kimley Winnipeg Icelanders, representing Canada in Antwerp, Belgium. They went through the series, and of course it was a joke. They won every game 15 or nothing and so on. But when the date was set, at the Palais de Glace in Antwerp for the big game, thousands, tens of thousands wanted to get in, all the way from peasants to lords and dukes and kings. And they didn't know how they could. There were at least 10 times as many as the rink could accommodate. Uh, I think it was the final game against the Americans. Uh, in order to get in the rink, you, you had to either fight your way or take our suitcases in. And somebody told me after I got in the rink that the uh, man that had, took my suitcase, he had it on the top of his head because he had to fight the crowd. And uh, they told me that he was a Belgian count. And the Canadians won. Eventually, it was a tough battle, but they won. Two nothing. And they were champions of the world. Well, the excitement. In fact, Winnipeg uh, had a holiday. Everything was declared a holiday, and the whole city turned out for our parade. And uh, they met us at the CPR depot, and uh, we, you know, the old tradition is sat on the top, back of the of the touring cars at that time. We were touring cars, you know, and, and we sat in back there, and and uh, they claimed that that was the largest parade they'd ever seen in the city of Winnipeg. But my father would always tell me uh, that. Uh, the, the Ghoulies were splendid people. He loved the Icelanders, and he, he, loved, he always referred to them as the Ghoulies. If someone uh, married a Ghoulie, then at last that family was getting some good Ghoulie blood. And I would say the Good Templars started this word Ghoulie, and that fits like a glove, because a Ghoulie is a, is a man who was raised by the Icelanders, and don't forget it. He's quite proud of it. Good Templars Hall, it was called the Ghoulie Hall, IOGT Hall. Now, this was a temperance society, which uh, may or may not have had some effect on the Icelanders, I don't know. 
But I know that in spite of the fact that the Icelanders have a reputation for love of alcohol, there were also attempts at trying to curb this with the temperance society. And the method of their work was to um, assist the individual with the drinking problem, and he would join the lodge, and he would take the pledge of total abstinence. And, and they would do everything they could to help that individual to uh, keep that pledge. Then they also worked in the community to, against the liquor traffic. I think the reputation is perhaps from a time past. Whenever the men would go away and they'd go up on the lake, they'd be gone for two months, they'd be gone for four months, they'd come back to town and for the Icelandic celebration, they'd hit town all in the boats. There they were for the celebration and they'd have a hell of a good time, you know. They would drink it up and they'd fight and they'd have a marvelous time. And then everybody say, boy, do those Icelanders ever drink? And you know, these guys have been out living, you know, like priests in a fish camp for two months. And in Iceland, the lodges began, I think, about 1884. And in the city of Reykjavik, they were very active. And there's a story told in Reykjavik that one man had been reinstated 98 times. And uh, when he applied to be reinstated for the 99th time, the uh, people, there was quite a controversy about it, but eventually they won out because they were supposed to assist the man with an alcohol problem. And he was reinstated the 19th time, and that time it stuck. I was brought up in the west end of Winnipeg, which was known as being Icelandic, but my next door neighbor friend was German, and my best friend was Italian, and my other best friend was Scottish. I used to call us the League of Nations. but. Where the, the um, Icelandic um, community gathered was the, uh, the church. There was always a lot of music and uh, singing. Um, my mom and dad both belonged to the, the church choir. And um, on occasion, we were dragged on Sunday evening. And when we could control ourselves and giggling, my sister and I, um, we, we enjoyed the singing. It was really quite beautiful. Icelandic churches were the center of all activity. They were the seat of culture, and from there everything else started, even the Good Templars and whatever organization they might have, the church was there, even the Icelandic Lutheran hockey team, and which uh, had a lot to do with the Falcons, and the, uh, everything you might think of. And, and the idea of going to church in those days was the uh, fathers and mothers would march their children to church, and they had certain pews, and I know the Bardells occupied two of them, and the same one every Sunday, and nobody dares sit in that pew. And they just march in and out again, and whatever they did, the parents said, there you are. So we, did, we got to accept that. And we had wonderful time with the young people's organizations, and they, they made it very interesting. And we had people from Iceland, I remember, who were specialists in young people, youth work, who helped to train us, and all done in Icelandic. Matter of fact, that was confirmed in Icelandic, baptized in Icelandic. Everything had to be marched in Icelandic. So that's why I still have the language a little bit. My parents spoke uh, Icelandic in the home and tried to get us children to learn it. And uh, to that end, they sent us uh, off to Saturday school. And uh, I can vividly remember uh, the age of seven in Saturday school, at which uh, all the kids would be jumping out the window and running around the front door and coming in the other end, whilst the teacher was giving the lesson at the front. So we never did take to it. The first Icelandic classes uh, at the university level were started at Wesley College in 1901 and instruction in Icelandic continued at that institution until about 1924. From the very beginning uh, there were people in the Icelandic communities in Manitoba promoting the idea of providing instruction in Icelandic language and literature. Uh, the um, 
uh, Icelandic classes at Wesley College were uh, uh, sponsored and partly paid for by the uh, Icelandic Lutheran Synod. Dr. Jo Jón Bjarnason was one of the men who were very prominent in promoting this idea. After his death, the Icelanders established the Jón Bjarnason Academy. They taught the usual high school subjects. In addition, they offered uh, instruction in Icelandic language and literature. I know I went there in 1920 myself, and uh, a lot of people besides Icelanders went there, but it was supported all the way through by Icelanders who gave to it and sent their children to it, whether they liked to go there or not, they had to go. I know, I had to go. And the children came from all over the province, Piney and Lundar and Riverton and Arborg and you name it, Gimli. They all came to the Owen Bellison Academy. This uh, academy lasted until 49 when the per original purpose ceased to exist because high schools became available generally around Manitoba. After the passage of a few years, um, the, the feeling grew that it would be, should be possible and it would be necessary to continue some institution for the teaching of Icelandic. And the, uh, the thought developed that, uh, that the ideal place for that would be the University of Manitoba and uh, a fund was raised when the uh, chair of the, at the university was established. This fund had amounted to $200,000. The money came in from people of Icelandic descent in three countries, Canada, the United States, and Iceland. In addition, the government of Iceland passed a law stating that Icelandic books would be sent to the university, Icelandic library, in perpetuity. The study of Icelandic is uh, uh, highly uh, relevant to uh, the study of Germanic language in general, whether these are German, English, Scandinavian languages, or uh, 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 even other Indo-European languages. And medieval Icelandic uh, literature not only represents Iceland, it represents the whole of Scandinavia, so, uh, parts of England, Germany, and uh, uh, Icelandic medieval historical literature uh, deals with European and uh, North American history. The Icelanders mainly came from Norway in the late Viking time, in the 9th and 10th centuries after Christ. We know it both from our historical sources, from our old literature, and also from the archaeological evidences. Well, there's often talk very much about the Irish element, and that a great part of the Icelandic people came from Ireland. But if we take these evidences we have today, then we can say our language is Scandinavian, with very few Irish words in it. Our material culture is and was Scandinavian. All the tools and weapons and so on we find in graves from the Viking time are of Scandinavian origin. But uh, we know also from the literature that the Norwegians who came over here, they went sometimes over to Ireland and took some slaves with them. And uh, naturally these slaves may have been mixed up by time with the, with the other people. Greenland was uh, discovered by people from Iceland around uh, 985. And Vinland or Wineland perhaps just a few years afterwards. The son of one of the Greenland settlers was returning from Iceland to Greenland when he was blown off course and first sighted the shores of North America. One of Eric the Red's sons, Leif Erikson, decided to take an expedition out and investigate and he traveled along the coast of 
North America, he landed at three separate spots. The first he named Helioland, probably on the Labrador coast. The second he named Markland, Forest Land. And the third he named Vinland, and that is, it is speculated is probably in the Cape Cod area. We think now that Wineland uh, may have been around the area of Newfoundland. Uh, it may have extended further south. No one knows. Shortly after uh, 1000, they made uh, a rather serious attempt to establish a, a permanent settlement in Wineland or Wineland. In spite of the, uh, the fertility of the land, these early explorers were too few in number to uh, establish a viable settlement. The sagas record that they ran into a number of problems with the Indians. One of the more gruesome and grotesque stories out of the sagas uh, is about this area. It records one Indian attack when a fierce uh, war party of Indians had attacked and all of the uh, Icelanders were heading back to their ships and they were saved by one woman who bared herself, marched at the Indians holding a sword and when they got close enough hacked off one of her breasts which appalled the Indians and uh, sent them fleeing in terror and saved the settlement for another little while. The first settlers came from Norway about the year 874. Christianity came to Iceland in year 1000 and after that they must have started writing. And these sagas are about happenings here in Iceland in the 9th and 10th century. The Icelandic sagas developed from stories that were told by the skalds. Now the skalds were the court poets who traveled throughout Scandinavia telling their stories and their poems. The uh, sagas were the stories of the exploits of heroes, the travels of the Vikings, sometimes stories of families over generations. We got much more literature in the sagas as they develop. It changed from dry historical writings. Njál saga, for instance. Gunnar of Lidarenda and his two brothers defied 33 men, and when they have killed a lot of them, the rest of them runs away. We get much more of unreal things. They cut people in pieces by one blow. And they start fighting dragons and such things. The sagas are heroic stories, much like novels, but because they've had hundreds of years of telling, they've become refined, and so they're intense and powerful works as well as their great prose writing. Their literature is their great glory, it's, uh, and it has continued down. Even in their poorest periods, they were turning out uh, charming poems that for every occasion had to be celebrated by a poem. And today in Canada, we have uh, the Icelanders writing in English as well as in Icelandic still. To put Icelandic Canadian literature in its proper perspective, it has to be regarded in the same way as we'd regard uh, any other immigrant literature. The early English Canadian writing, the writing by Finnish immigrants, Ukrainian immigrants, German immigrants. It's has to be measured against those kinds of literatures and uh, on that level it stands up pretty well. It's basically a literature of exile and so uh, its interest is uh, narrower. It's only one part of the Canadian experience. It doesn't, mo most of it doesn't go beyond that so that ultimately most of the Icelandic Canadian literature written in Icelandic is more important to Iceland than it is to Canada. Whenever the Icelanders first came to Canada, they were very poor. Uh, they came in boxcars. They didn't travel in luxury at all. They had a very difficult time. They had, they had a very difficult time just surviving, but they never gave up their books. They kept their books with them, and that's a source of pride to everybody in the community, and still is today, the fact that those books were on the shelves in the first settlers' cabins. And that has had a tremendous impact on the community today. Uh, I come from Gimli lived here all my life and I'm a writer and I get tremendous support 
simply because the people here really appreciate anybody in the fine arts. They support painters, musicians. They'll collect money to, to help you. They'll buy your books. They'll go to your concerts. They'll do whatever is necessary. They put their money where their mouth is. They'll do whatever they can to help somebody in the fine arts. And that comes out of the fact that they so much appreciated literature whenever they first came. And, and they were literate for, a, you know, a, what, a thousand years before they first came. In, within the last few years, uh, there seems to be, have been an awakening among the younger Icelanders in their heritage. A lot of them, when they were young, um, had no desire to learn Icelandic at all. And as a result, we seem to have lost a whole generation of Icelandic-speaking Icelanders in Canada. And it's only been within the last four or five years that there's been a reawakening of a need for this Icelandic heritage. Colors are letirnir. Letirnir. This is our second year at Gimlin, Manitoba with the language camp. We have children from three prairie provinces, Ontario and North Dakota and Manitoba. There is 58 enrollment this year. Good. Okay, borði er þarna. Hvað er þetta? Most of these children come from homes where there's very little Icelandic spoken. Maybe visiting grandparents and that's about all. Good. Boys over there, hvað er þetta? Þetta er blátt. Okay. Now how the basis of the, the camp is the language course, but we feel that what we offer the children is more of a history and uh, just a general enrichment of the whole Icelandic culture that perhaps is lost when they're attending other schools where there isn't too large an Icelandic factor. At East Landing, a dog, and we meet in Gimle by to celebrate the fortune we have found. To make sure the best traditions of old Iceland never die in the children of this new Icelandic town. Each year, we Icelanders hold an Eastlanding Dagaren, an Icelandic day. It serves the purpose of a reunion, it celebrates the arrival of the first Icelanders in Canada, and it reaffirms ties with the old land. The first of these was held in Winnipeg in 1890, and it's continued in an unbroken tradition for 86 years. In 1932, they changed the location of the celebration to Gimli. The chief focal point of this celebration is the Hjelkona, or Maid of the Mountains, a sort of a Mother Iceland figure. She represents the island, the mountains, the geysers, the people, the language, the literature, the arts, all of Icelandic culture. And an interesting feature is that she is always an older married woman chosen because of her contribution to the community and she's quite different from the usual beauty queen. At East Landing, a dagger, and we crown the mountain maid, both young and old, each heart is good and scared. We come from miles around to join the old song sung and played at this legendary new Icelanders fair. My grandfather left Iceland, he said, for one reason, that his uh, children could have a better life. The Icelanders were uh, a people who moved about, who took what appeared to be pretty large risks, and they did them fairly easily. And to a, it's hard to account for that, but perhaps one of the reasons is that the culture prepared them for this in its literature and in particularly in its sagas. The sagas approved a kind of masculine daring, they approved risk-taking, they approved voyages, the story of the Vinland saga, the stories of people uprooted and outlawed, moving around, tended to approve not a kind of stable and quiet uh, home existence, but a kind of taking of risks, a kind of moving about. And that may, in fact, have been the kind of cultural thing that permitted the 
large migrations to Canada and that permitted them once they were here to pull up roots when they were getting pretty old and change to start whole new lives in the age of 55 or 60. The most remarkable thing to me about these people was that they came here with nothing and uh, I, I know my grandfather he was 55 years of age when he came here and he, he brought absolutely nothing except uh, a few belongings in a little trunk, a grandma spinning wheel, and maybe a couple of eider downs, and very little of anything else. And, and at age 55, he, he, he made us start making a home in, in, in the bush along the lake and built a, built a, a log house, and uh, then he started to clear the land and make a living. I, I think that took tremendous courage, and I, I'm, I'm really proud that, uh, that um, I'm a descender of these people because uh, if we had people with that kind of courage today, I don't think we'd have as many problems as we have. In 75, New Iceland grew from Gimlet's sandy shore. We built our homes with all we found in nature's buried store. Not huts of sod, oh no, thank God, we built our homes with wood. No sheep dung heat to warm our feet, but blazing fire stood. In this land of many wonders, we had gained what we came for. We'd left the trusty pony for the dog team and the sleigh. We traded midnight summers for the fly-infested day. The bitter cold to took her toll and fate called many shots. The raging flu and fever threw the scourge off the small park. In this land of many wonders, Mother Nature had her way. We've lost the saga language and the old Icelandic poem. But we've kept the Viking spirit of the stock from which we've grown. We gained the land that's mighty grand and looking through the years. We got much more than we came for in the Iceland we built here. This land of many wonders we are proud to call our home.